welcome back to my channel my name is Louisa if you're new don't forget to subscribe and if you're coming back welcome back so today's topic was actually something that I addressed a few years ago when I had my old channel and um, it's coercive control not very much has changed <laughs> since then it seems like people who are very manipulative always follow similar scripts like they're not very different from each other it's quite interesting so they tend to employ the same tactics every time with multiple people and if you've met one manipulative person you've probably met a template for all of them but today in particular I wanted to talk about how Manipulative people always seem to get into these really uh, strong attachments with perceptive people. And that's a very interesting dynamic, which I thought was worth examining on its own. It seems like such a contradiction to say that someone who is highly perceptive is actually really at risk of getting involved with someone who is manipulative. Like, how does that work? Before we get started, I just want to say that some of the things that I will be talking about today could be a bit uh, difficult if you have been through trauma in the past. Um, if you find this content a little bit confronting, feel free to just click off, maybe watch it at another time when you feel a little bit more able to process things. And if you do experience any distress, please make sure that you seek help if you need it. I often try to look at the funny side of things when it comes to very serious topics, but they are very serious topics. And so we might try and make light of them in order to help process them. But at the end of the day, they still have a huge impact on your mental well-being. And I definitely don't want to minimize that. And I definitely don't want you to be unaware of the fact that this might have an impact on you. So one of the things that I have learned about manipulative people over the years from personal experience is they don't often waste their time on people who are kind of blissfully unaware of their true nature or what it is that they're actually doing. They tend to just leave those people alone. They're not going to target someone who is not wise to them. So when they come across someone who is fairly perceptive and they can often tell this from like listening to your conversations with other people that you'll find manipulative people are always listening to everything that you say to other people. They are busy scanning the environment for threats. And so, of course, a perceptive person is a potential threat. And this is why they tend to zero in on them because they're trying to neutralize the threat. They need to manage you before you identify the smell of BS and the source of where it's coming from. But it's more than just trying to eliminate a threat. It's also the fact that you present a shiny, delicious challenge. They want to know exactly how long they can fool you, string you along and mess with your head. So not only are they simultaneously trying to neutralize a threat, but they are also getting off on the power trip of being able to pull the wool over the eyes of someone who is quite perceptive. Now, manipulators are not always consciously aware of what it is that they're actually doing. They don't necessarily say to themselves, oh, this person is on to me, I better mess with them. <laughs> Generally, all they're aware of is the fact that they have this overwhelming urge and need to control the situation, to control you. And it's because you have spiked their adrenaline and also at the same time with your delicious challengeness, they have experienced maybe 
other neurochemicals like dopamine. So with this heady cocktail of bodily chemicals, they are potentially misconstruing it as infatuation or even love. And at the same time that they are experiencing this kind of pseudo infatuation, they are trying to convince their target that they are also experiencing a form of love or pseudo infatuation. And they will try to convince you that the alarm bells that are going off in your intuition to say something is wrong here, they will try and convince you that those alarm bells are a sign of love. And one of the problems that we have with our culture these days is that Hollywood runs that narrative as well. So we are culturally indoctrinated to believe that alarm bells and experiencing a type of fear of someone and trepidation about someone is love. So if someone is so perceptive and they've got this intuition and their intuition is giving them these alarm bells, how do they get fooled? Well, often the biggest problem with a perceptive person is they have become perceptive because they have had to deal with this a lot. And so they turn into these kind of detective types who are constantly trying to assess the situation, who are very observant because they have had to be in the past. And the problem is if you have had a lot of experience with abusers, sometimes you just get acclimatized to it and you think that this is a normal dynamic between someone that you are very attached to. And of course, trauma bonding is a very strong form of attachment. It's very unhealthy, but it's extremely strong, partly because of the neurochemical cocktail. Another thing about perceptive people that makes them vulnerable to manipulative people is that they have this overwhelming need to get to the truth. It's like an itch that needs to be scratched. So the manipulative person is kind of like an allergen that irritates the perceptive person. And rather than getting rid of the allergen, they scratch it and they scratch that itch by staying in an unhealthy dynamic with a toxic person because they are constantly trying to find the truth. They're constantly trying to validate their intuition and their own perception. But a manipulative person will never validate your perception of reality. They will just gaslight you. So there's this tension between total polar opposites of like truth and lies and deception and honesty. And if neither party is willing to walk away unsatisfied or unfulfilled by the dynamic, then neither of them will let go. So they kind of just stay enmeshed. If you are a truth seeking perceptive person, you will never find satisfaction from a manipulative person. They will trigger your itchy need to have the truth, but they will never fulfill it. And you'll find that the more you try to get to the bottom of their manipulative hole, the more they dig. So it's an endless quest with no destination. So you have to learn to let go. You have to learn to walk away without satisfying your curiosity and without validating your intuition. You have to validate your own intuition. And that's something that takes a bit of time and it takes persistence on your part. And if you've been gaslit over the years, then you will very much doubt that your ability to read into a situation and to use your intuition is working. You th might think that it's faulty, but that's where videos like this come in. And also the blog article, which I will link in the description box for you. So you can read that if you want 
and you can go back over these notes anytime you are dealing with a new person who is setting off your alarm system. And you can say, right, there's a list of behaviors. There is a pattern of behaviors and I can identify exactly what that is early on in the process and disengage as quickly as possible before this person burrows in like a tick. Because they will. That is the aim. They are planning on infiltrating your life to such a degree that you cannot get rid of them. All right, let's get into the signs that you have encountered a manipulative person. Sign number one, manipulative people are humble braggers. There are some things that I really love about the internet. And one of those things is the ability to come up with really fun labels for things like humble braggers, because it's so true. I have literally heard manipulative people call themselves humble, <laughs> especially in church where you know that it's part of their facade of being seen as a true believer. However, by calling themselves humble, they kind of give themselves away because truly humble people don't brag about their own awesomeness. They tend to just want to live their lives in peace. Like a truly healthy, good person is a very balanced person. They don't need validation from other people to tell them that they're good. They don't feel that need. If they're Christian, they should also get a lot of their validation just from having a relationship with God. But also they're the sorts of people who think that actions speak louder than words. And they do. A healthy person also doesn't congratulate themselves on doing the bare minimum. They are not busy giving themselves props for helping other people out because they just see it as a normal part of life and being a decent human being. <laughs> a good person tends to look outwards towards other people and to genuinely see other people, which means that they are genuinely moved by empathy when they see someone who is struggling. And that's the thing that prompts them to help out. It's not this need to be recognized and puffed up in some way. And a healthy person has a good balance of helping out other people and also looking after themselves. So they never turn into these self-sacrificing martyrs who need to tell people how much they have sacrificed for other people. Humble braggers, on the other hand, will incessantly tell you all of the amazing things that they have done for anyone at any time. And it's usually the same things over and over again because they might have done something once and they're going to get as much mileage out of that one thing as they possibly can. Half the time they're all talk and no action, but even the smallest thing will be magnified so that just being a decent human being is like an amazing achievement and they should be recognized for it. So here is my impression of a humble bragger. I am such a nice guy slash gal. Everyone says so, especially me. I am always doing stuff for other people, even when they don't want me to. I have such a servant heart. I'm almost Jesus. You know, people tell me all the time how special and talented I am, but I don't let it go to my head because I'm so humble. Yeah, this type of person was especially repugnant to Jesus. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise you have no reward from your father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing 
that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Sign number two is a self-righteous gossiper who fishes for information. So this is somewhat related to the humble bragger, where it's all about facade management. They tend to congratulate themselves quite a bit and also put a lot of faith in their own willpower and not really credit God with having any influence in their lives. They tend to lean on their own strength and understanding. Jesus told a parable about this type of person in Luke chapter 18. Also, he, Jesus, spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector, I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So you will often find this person, while they are self-righteously looking down on other people, they will also be indiscreet about other people's information and they will gossip. So if anyone confides in them or if they witness anyone having a vulnerable moment, that becomes social currency that they barter with later on and if they're doing this with people who are healthy and well-adjusted, it will weird those people out. So to try and counteract that, they tend to dress up their gossiping as concern for other people, which it is not. Realistically, it's a way for them to favorably compare themselves with someone who they think is lesser than them. This information does not belong to them, it belongs to someone else. It's someone else's private business. And they have no business sharing it without that person's permission. And because of this behavior, you might find that you are very hesitant to share your own information with this person, but you'll probably also notice that they tend to ask you a lot of questions, that they are fishing for information, that they are looking for social currency on you that they can trade with someone else or which they can use as a potential smear campaign if you eventually call them out on their behavior. So your alarm system is going off for a reason. Sign number three, they force intimacy. So this is related to the previous sign where they're very indiscreet about other people's information. That's a form of breaking people's boundaries. Not only the person who they're gossiping about, but also your boundaries. Like you don't want to be burdened with deeply personal information about someone else. And it's also a level of intimacy that this manipulative person hasn't earned yet with you. Manipulative people also tend to tell you deeply personal stuff about themselves. The expression TMI tends to come to mind with these people. And they will do this as a means of trying to make you comfortable about reciprocating and revealing very personal things about yourself. The way that they talk to you in general might be a bit overly familiar compared to the actual length of your relationship or the actual depth of your relationship. Like I said before, they haven't earned it. They might create a pet name for you, like a nickname. They'll skip the preamble of social chit chat and just go straight into trying to talk about personal stuff. Or they might talk about your personality as though they know you extremely well and can say who you are as a person. 
Sometimes they use touch as a means of crossing a boundary. Sometimes they'll turn up at your house or at your work. They give you gifts that you did not ask for, for no apparent reason. And this next one is the real kicker. They will talk to your friends and family as though they already know them and as though they are more intimate with you than they actually are. They will start implying that they are your bestest buddy or that you're in a relationship when you are not. And this particular form of rushing intimacy will become important very shortly. But there is another aspect to this which is pretending to have the same interests as you and pretending to have the same goals or the same aspirations, uh, pretending to know about the same stuff. They probably don't have hobbies of their own. Sometimes they do. It depends on whether their hobbies are like socially powerful but they will magnify any kind of common ground that you might have, or they will manufacture common ground so that they can force intimacy. So these people latch on hard and fast, and they try to ensure that their tentacles reach into as many facets of your life as possible so that it becomes really hard to disengage from them. Sign number four, triangulation, isolation, and domination. So they have begun to weave their web and you, the innocent fly, have been ensnared. As I mentioned just before, one of their first strategies is to infiltrate as many of your close personal relationships as they possibly can, including friends, family, and work colleagues. They are going to ingratiate themselves with the people who are closest to you for the dual purpose of managing their own facade and also undermining yours. They want to manipulate how other people see you. And this is all about triangulation. So they insert themselves between you and the other people in your life. And it gives them the position of being like a linchpin where all forms of communication must pass through them. They are the source of getting to you. They will make sure that people talk to them instead of talking to you. Sometimes they'll say things like, oh, he or she is not feeling well. They're not up to it. They're a bit fragile at the moment. You better stop talking to me. I know how to handle them. And this is their opening to not only become a linchpin, but also to become a wedge, a wedge between you and all of your other supportive relationships. And of course, a lot of this comes back to gossip. So the things that they were saying about other people to you, they are now saying to other people about you. Again, this is a favorable comparison for themselves. It's a way to make themselves look better. And it's also a way to undermine you in the eyes of other people. Some people will actually congratulate them on putting up with you. But other people who find it very icky will simply withdraw. They'll be repulsed by the behavior without quite knowing why. And unfortunately, the effect that it normally has is to drive them away. And so you still end up isolated. In order for a manipulative person to be seen as an authority on who you are and claim to have the ability to tell other people who you are, they are going to be all over your social media feed, liking, commenting, being the first person there. It's a bit creepy and invasive, but they need to be seen as the person who is there, as the person who is very involved in your life. In some situations, they will even start speaking on your behalf. 
So they are now your mouthpiece. They need to be able to isolate you in order to exert maximum control over your life. And so this is one of the other reasons why they need to be all over your social media feed. They need to know every detail of every interaction that you have ever had with another person. This is for the purposes of triangulation, so they can maybe plant seeds in your mind that your friends and family don't like you, that nobody supports you, etc, etc. But also they need to be able to monitor whatever the narrative is. They need to make sure that no one is saying anything about them that might alert you to what they're doing. If you allow them too much into your life, they may get to the point where they start demanding access to your social media and they will start exerting so much control that it's no longer your social media. It's theirs and they've put your face on it and they are speaking for you and shaping how other people perceive you. These people can be so overbearing, like the noisiest, most aggressive seagull at the beach, that other people just end up backing away from you. It's too much trouble to be your friend. When you become isolated, then they can dominate you. You will be far more vulnerable and even potentially dependent on an abuser. And because you are isolated from other relationships, especially healthy ones, where someone can provide a bit of uh, an outside perspective or a sounding board for you to just talk things out, because you are cut off from this necessary support, it becomes possible for them to shape your perception of reality and to gaslight you. Sign number five is that you are lost in the woods or can't see the wood for the trees and also that you are constantly trying to hit a moving target. So this is the phase where you really start to doubt your own sanity. Because a manipulative abuser will be playing with your mind, they will do this by presenting a constant barrage of moving targets especially in the form of like lies or half truths or omitting the truth. And they will try to tell you that you are not entitled to the truth. So because you are trying to pin them down and figure out what is real and what is not real, and they're just popping up with all of these lies everywhere. And as soon as you try and locate one, it's shifted. The truth is perpetually out of reach. They also tend to deliberately cause havoc wherever they go. So you will be attempting to put out one dumpster fire and they're off down the street, setting a trash can on fire and throwing a Molotov cocktail into a moving vehicle. And their utter chaos will keep you very busy with your fire extinguisher. So busy that you do not have time to sort out your own thoughts and feelings and to actually figure out what is going on, which is exactly how they want you, frazzled. The bewildered and stressed version of you is exactly what they need in order to validate their lies to other people. They can now blame everything on you and look like a saint in comparison. And the final sign, sign number six, is playing the victim. When you eventually have to confront this person about their behavior, they will probably be hurt. They will probably talk about how awesome they are and how they don't deserve this kind of treatment from you, even though they are the ones who have treated you badly. <laughs> this is a way to deflect accountability by turning the tables and attacking you. They will also probably make a public appeal for sympathy, either by talking to all of their friends and family or by posting something on social media. This is classic manipulation. They always position themselves as the spotless victim so that they have no accountability whatsoever 
for the absolute disaster that they have caused. And this is where the smear campaign comes into effect. Now they would have set this up early on. They have been probably systematically lying about you to other people since the first day that you met them. You might be totally unaware of what these particular lies about you are. You might find out about them later, in which case they will make you very angry. But it's a way to invalidate anything that you say about them and to make you look crazy and irrational. And so finally, it is important to understand that there is no justice to be had here. The earlier that you can identify a manipulator and cut your losses and get the hell out of there, distance yourself from this person, maybe even leave whatever organization they happen to be part of, the earlier you can do this, the better. But the problem with manipulative people is they choose their targets very carefully. It is premeditated. They know when you are the new person, when you are someone who has no friends or family in the vicinity. They know if you have no supportive network and you will be prime prey for that kind of person. If you're not in that sort of physically vulnerable situation, then sometimes they will target you anyway, but they will do so with the view to like moving somewhere and convincing you to give up this supportive environment that you currently live in, in order to place all of your trust and all of your vulnerability in them. And of course, this is usually to do with a future faking, pie in the sky kind of daydream that they have sold you on. Sometimes it's just that they have latched on to what your dreams and ambitions are, and they are pretending to help you fulfill them. But sometimes they present a move away as the solution to a problem that they created. One of the other reasons why you will probably get no satisfaction and no justice from a situation with a manipulative person is they thoroughly understand that they need to ingratiate themselves amongst other people and within an organization and they need to make themselves indispensable. It's not just you that they're burrowing like a tick amongst. They do it with everyone. This means that if you choose to take a stand and refuse to put up with their treatment of you, you may find yourself on the outside of whatever group they were part of. In my past experience with my ex-husband, that included my own friends. Now, you shouldn't let that intimidate you, but it is something that you need to be aware of. And another thing that you need to be aware of is the fact that these people can be very dangerous. They have such an urge to control that anything that threatens their sense of control, they will use whatever means necessary to neutralize it. They may become violent, whether they have a history of violence or not. And you should never be fooled by any promises that they make or how pathetic they look, because sometimes they will turn on the patheticness and try to guilt you into sympathy for them, even though they are the one who has badly mistreated you. So make sure that you plug into safe relationships, people who will not sell you out to this person because as I said before, your own friends could be dangerous to you now because this person has recruited them. There are specialist organizations that deal with this kind of abuse and they will help you to develop an exit strategy. So sometimes it's important not to tip your hand until you are safe. Do not prioritize justice or retribution until you have had time to get safe and until you have had time to heal. If you believe that you can or should prosecute later, then do so. You have time to do that at a later date. 
And you should always remember that the Lord your God fights on your behalf and vengeance is his. He will repay. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching. Hopefully that was helpful. Let me know in the comments if you have your own experiences or if you have any other tips and tricks on how to spot a manipulator. Take care out there and I will see you next time. Bye.